We are now going to begin a new unit uh, on curves and derivatives of curves, derivatives on curves, integrals on curves, uh, and things called line integrals. So we're going to begin this unit by talking about curves themselves, how we can describe them, and what their properties are. So we introduce uh, a new mathematical concept, uh, a vector function which has one independent variable or parameter called t or anything else really but often t and for each of those values t it returns a vector uh, r and if we think of the r as being points in say a three-dimensional space then this set of points r of t can be thought of as a curve in space and since R is nothing more than a description of the three components, the I component, the J component, and then K component, uh, this is known, and we have a, a parametric representation for X, Y, and Z. This is known as a parametric curve. So here we have an example of a parametric curve, just a small sketch. For some time, T1, uh, we have a vector pointing from the origin to this point, R1 in space. And then as uh, time evolves, the vector uh, evolves, it points somewhere new in space, and at a later time it points somewhere new in space, and it gradually traces out this curve through space that I have just sketched here, uh, and ends at some point T2. So uh, we should be able to notice a few things about this curve. It's sort of complicated, it twists around, it sort of turns back in on itself. Uh, it does kind of complicated things, and uh, parametric curves are able to do this, which makes them an ideal tool for describing real curves in space. This could be, for instance, uh, the flight path of a bumblebee or an airplane or something kind of flying around in space. Uh, I hope to get you by the end of this class to really love parametric curves because they are the ideal tool for describing curves. We should really always think about describing things parametrically. Uh, in calculus, you learned uh, the curve, calculus 1, you learned how to describe lines say um, y equals f of x and that's okay but uh, we want one thing is that uh, it can only be single valued right it can't have two values for a given function of x parametric curves have no such uh, limitation they can intersect each other they can do all kinds of crazy things so that they can be as complicated as is required to describe a real situation uh, this same function here, if we move to higher dimensions, now it becomes a cylinder. If we have z is involved somewhere in space, but we don't specify its value, then this function is no longer a curve. It's a surface called a cylinder. And in higher dimensions, it's a higher dimensional surface. So such a way of describing something, it's not clear how many dimensions this object possesses unless you know how many dimensions are available. Uh, in contrast, a parametric curve, you always know the number of dimensions of the object itself. It's just the number of parameters. So if it has just the one parameter t, the one independent variable, then it's a one-dimensional object. Uh, so parametric representation is very clear how many dimensions are present. Uh, parametric curves can be easily measured. If you have an accurate GPS sensor on some object like a plane, you can easily track its position through space. And what you get returned to you is a set of points in 3D that you can connect as a parametric curve. Uh, it's easy to plot these items on a computer and uh, with some effort to visualize them in our heads. And again, we have just this one variable. Uh, no matter how many dimensions, we have just one variable, and so it's easy to do calculus on curves. So parametric curves are the best way to describe one-dimensional curves in space. No other way of representing them has all of these advantages. And so we want to really learn a little bit about how these things work uh, how to write them down, uh, and so on. And a common task that we'll find is to have a curve described in some other way, perhaps verbally, perhaps as the intersection of some surfaces or something like this, to take such a verbal description and come up with the parametric equations for a curve. Uh, just a couple of examples of parametric curves. Here is a function, a vector function. It is a three-dimensional function which has an i component, j component, k component, and the magnitude of each of those components uh, differs with time. So here we have uh, written in vector form. We can break that down into parametric form, x equals t, y equals cosine t, z equals 2 sine of t. Now, 
how could we visualize this object? Obviously, it's staring at you on the screen. Uh, but suppose it weren't. You could say, uh, well, here I have uh, cosines and sines, and I recognize those. And in fact, I know something about them. I know that cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. So I could write y squared plus z divided by 2 squared would be cosine squared plus sine squared equaling 1. And that, y squared plus z over 2 squared equals 1, is uh, the equation for an ellipse. So if we ignore x for a moment and just consider the yz projection, then this is an ellipse. Uh, in addition to that information, we see that x is just increasing linearly as a function of time. So we can sketch an ellipse in the plane. Uh, here is our ellipse in the yz plane. And now we can just gradually increase uh, x as we wind our way around the ellipse. And we see that this object is uh, helical in nature. And we would call this an elliptical helix. Uh, if uh, the coefficients of y and z were the same, it would be a circular helix. Uh, but this is a very common curve. And as you see, it's quite simple to represent parametrically with just these simple functions t, cosine t, and 2 sine t. Uh, another example. Here we have uh, another simple parametric function. Uh, x equals t squared, y equals t, and z equals sine of t. Uh, we can think of this, if we like, as the intersection of two surfaces. Um, we have, for if we just ignore x, then we have y equals t and z equals sine of t, which we could rewrite z equals sine y. So the x projection, the projection onto the yz plane, uh, is just a simple sine curve. And I've tried to sketch that here. It's a cylinder in red, uh, a cylinder, sinusoidal cylinder, coming out in the x direction. Uh, if we look at only the x and y projection, we let y equals t, x equals t squared. That's the parabola, x equals y squared. And so we have a parabolic cylinder going vertically in the z direction, which I've tried to draw here. And the curve can be thought of as the intersection of those two surfaces. So it's this sort of oscillating uh, object, which uh, lives on both the cylinder and the sine curve, like that. Now, if my drawings are not uh, exceptional, I have some computer plots. Uh, first, the helix. Here is a computer plot of the helix. We can kind of see the cylinder that inside this curve is wrapped around the cylinder, and it winds its way in the positive x direction around a cylinder in the yz plane. And uh, we can also, whoops. Visualize this other curve, this sine parabola thing. Uh, if we look at it from above, the xy projection indeed looks like a parabola. If we look at it from the side, the yz projection does look like a sine curve. And um, it's a little bit harder to visualize, but I've, I've sketched those two projections in, in dotted lines, and we can see this curve kind of living uh, at the intersection of those two things, this blue line. So it's quite easy for computers to, uh, to plot these kind of curves, to get a look at them. So I said that a, a common thing we would want to do would be to come up with the parameterization of a curve. One task could be, uh, given the parameterization, sketch the curve. Uh, but computers are actually very good at that, and humans are, are not so good at it. Uh, it's good things to practice in your mind, kind of trying to visualize what you ought to expect. But it's not always easy. Uh, and so what was, is actually very useful for humans to do is to do the opposite. Given uh, some other description of a curve, come up with the parametric description of it. So for example, you might be given uh, two surfaces in three dimensions, uh, given, say, um, uh, implicitly by such a function like f equals c1 and g equals c2. And these would be two implicit surfaces. Um, and asked to find the curve of intersection. So we have three variables, x, y, and z. Uh, we have two equations between them. That's three unknowns with two equations. That leaves us with one degree of freedom, which is represented by this parameter t. Unfortunately, uh, like it says on the page, there's, there's no general solution for solving nonlinear equations in this way. Uh, if there were linear equations only, then, then linear algebra teaches us how to do that. But here, unfortunately, we have no generally strategy. 
However, we can uh, we can sometimes make progress, and it's it's useful to review the parametric equations of conic sections. So if we have here an ellipse, here's the standard form of an ellipse: x squared over a, x over a quantity squared, y over b quantity squared equals one. Uh, this reminds us of a trig identity that cosine squared plus sine squared equals one, and it suggests that we let x equal a cosine t and y equal b sine t, and that will give us the ellipse of this kind. Similarly, for our hyperbola, uh, x over a squared minus y over b squared, uh, this reminds us of the hyperbolic trig function identity that cosh squared minus sinh squared equals one. So we can let x equal a cosh t and b y equal b sinh t, and that will give us the parametric equations of a hyperbola. Um, so for example, our final example of this video, find a parametric representation of the intersection of the elliptical cylinder given by this equation, 4x squared plus y squared equals 4, and the plane 3x plus 2y minus z equals 4. So uh, this is an, can be seen as an elliptical cylinder if we divide through by 4, then we get x squared plus y divided by 2 squared equals 1. That is an ellipse in the xy plane. We don't say anything about z, so z can be anything that makes an elliptical cylinder rather than just an ellipse. Um, and so we can go ahead, given this information, and let x equal cosine t, and let y equal 2 sine t. And uh, then we have here z is a function of x and y, and we can just say rewrite that function, replacing the x's with cosine t and the y's with 2 sine t. So now we have x equals cosine t, y equals 2 sine t, z equals 4 plus 3 cosine t plus 4 sine t. Uh, we see that we have this one degree of freedom, t. t can be any number, uh, although it's periodic, so it lives between 0 and 2 pi. Uh, but we definitely have this one degree of freedom, which we expect given that we are looking for the intersection of two surfaces. And if we sketch that, uh, here we have the cylinder, here I've tried to sketch the plane, and the curve will be here in green, the intersection of those two surfaces, uh, here now in parametric form, suitable for us to do other math on it in a future lesson.